all of us have the human right to health care. And to fulfill that human right, health officials need data. They need to know where there's an outbreak. They need to know who's affected. They need to know how many doctors to put in the clinics, how many drugs. But that data comes from all of us. It rep represents the best of us and the worst of us. And our biases are producing biased data. And when we plug biased data into algorithms that health officials use to make decisions, it can amplify discrimination. And that can undermine the right to health for all of us. So let me explain, and I'm going to use the example of a study I did with some colleagues on HIV. Globally, we could end the HIV epidemic if 95% of the people living with HIV were tested and knew their status, and if 95% of those who test positive start treatment, and if 95% of those who start treatment stay on it long enough, the virus is no longer detectable in the bloodstream, and undetectable is untransmittable. So we could end HIV as a global public health threat. And all the countries in the world have committed to this. But there's a problem, inequality. So the World Health Organization has reviewed the available data, and they've identified key populations who are most at risk of HIV. And those groups are gay men, though we say men who have sex with men, because many do not identify as gay. So men who have sex with men, sex workers, people who use drugs, especially injecting drugs, and transgender people. But in many countries, these key populations are reluctant to go into government health clinics because they've experienced being treated with disrespect. They've experienced stigma and discrimination. They don't believe their data is safe. And many countries also criminalize key populations' behavior, criminalize same-sex sexuality between consenting male adults, criminalize sex work, criminalize drug use. Very few countries will recognize a legal change of gender identity on your ID card. And so, as one activist said to me, she said, as a transgender woman, if I go to a clinic, I go as a man because that's what's on my ID card. And my data disappears. These are uncounted people. They're caught in a data paradox in which governments deny the key populations exist. Leaders will say, there are no gay men in this country. There are no sex workers here. And so no health research is done about their urgent needs. The lack of data means that services that could save their lives are not funded. And the lack of services reinforces the lack of data. It's a vicious cycle of inequality in which absence of evidence is used as evidence of their absence. So how can we break this vicious cycle? We compared countries that criminalize same-sex sexual behavior with countries that do not criminalize. And we looked at indicators that those countries report to the UN on their progress towards the end of HIV. And we found three things. First, countries that criminalize same-sex sexual behavior tend to have much smaller size estimates of the number of men who have sex with men in their country. Those men are hiding from risk of arrest. They are uncounted people. And countries that impose the death penalty, the numbers are even smaller. Or there's no size estimates at all. And it's not that those men don't exist. They are uncounted. Second, when health officials plug this biased data into algorithms that they use to assess which HIV interventions are cost effective, which they should fund first, it looks like services 
for groups that are stigmatized that have small size estimates don't have a big return on investment. And for transgender women, it's actually even worse because most countries have no data on transgender women. Only 46 countries have ever reported estimates of the number of transgender women in the country to the UN. That means there's 150 plus countries with no size estimates for transgender women. And where there's no size estimates, most likely there are no services that could save those women's lives. Uncounted means unserved. The third thing that we found was a little bit confusing. It, it really didn't make sense at first. It looked like countries that criminalized same-sex sexual behavior actually were doing better than countries that don't at reaching men who have sex with men to test for HIV. And this is really puzzling, actually worrying, because activists had told us for years they were avoiding government clinics out of fear of arrest. So we looked a little closer, and it was just 12 countries that were skewing the results globally, 12 countries that had reported over 90% of men who have sex with men tested for HIV and knew their status. Algeria reported 96.6%. Hungary, 100%. And we couldn't really make any sense out of this. It was just really confusing. So we'd reached the end of what the data could tell us, and we reached out to the communities in those countries to ask for insight. We contacted LGBTQ activists in the 12 countries, and we asked them, what does this data mean? Do you believe this, these numbers? Do you see this in your communities? Is your government doing something special, maybe, to reach men who have sex with men and win their trust? And the activists wrote back, and they were furious. They said, no, we do not believe this data. Most of the men in our networks have never been tested for HIV. They're hiding, risk of arrest. And it was Dr. John Waters in the Caribbean, a researcher and activist working closely with communities, who made it all clear. He said, here in the Caribbean, we have very small countries, devoutly religious. Most of the men who have sex with men are leading double lives. Many are married to women. He said, the governments have these tiny denominators, and they think they're reaching all of the men who have sex with men, but they're missing who knows how many uncounted people. And then it was all clear. Algeria, 96.6%. That was based on a national size estimate of 59 men who have sex with men. 57 picked up their test results, and Algeria reported 96.6%. Hungary reported 100% based on a single group of 300 men. Lack of data, lack of services, data paradox. And globally, it's clear we are failing to end HIV. And it's in part because of uncounted people. 62% of new HIV infections are among key populations. And that percentage increases year by year. And if we keep doing what we've always done, we'll continue to miss uncounted people. And uncounted will mean unserved. So how do we break this vicious cycle? Well, I have heard some absurd solutions, uh, technological fixes. Implant chips in all the key populations, outreach workers, so they can track down where people are hiding. <laughs> Use biometrics and count them one by one. You guys, these are people who do not trust the governments, right? So any measure that doesn't rep rep respect the fundamental right to privacy, the fundamental human dignity of a marginalized, criminalized group will fail. Sure, you might get a few people to be counted. Some people might have no choice. But many more will continue to vote with their feet and avoid being counted, and uncounted will mean unserved and absence of evidence about them will continue to be used as evidence of their absence. So are there any solutions? There are a few. 
and I'm going to tell you one. After we spoke, John Waters, that researcher in the Caribbean, he did a study, six Eastern Caribbean countries, to do the first um, key population size estimates. They've never had any data on key populations before. And he used participatory action research. So he worked in partnership with the community leaders to design the study, write the questionnaires, develop approaches that would protect the privacy, the confidentiality of the communities. And because some of the researchers were themselves transgender women, sex workers, men who have sex with men, they had the trust of the community. And a lot of people came forward to be counted. And they got incredibly rich data. And so today, if you look at the UN map of the 45 countries that have any size estimates reported for transgender women, you can see that one of them is St. Lucia, tiny, beautiful country with its first ever size estimate of 300 transgender women. And now the government can work with that community to design services that will meet people's needs. And this is urgent. This is not just about HIV. For every epidemic, there are uncounted people people who are stigmatized, discriminated against, people who are hidden, whose fundamental right to health care is denied. And it's our biases that produce this biased data. And we're all connected. So if we want to end epidemics, we have to end the biases. We have to end stigma and discrimination and work in partnership with marginalized communities to design the research, to have them be the counters who do the counting and ensure that everyone counts.